Welcome to Celebrating Act Two with Manny Pacheco, our Hollywood historian extraordinaire. Hey, Manny, it's great to see you again. You know, we uh, we often love talking about the great classic actors of Hollywood. Sure. And I, I wanted to share with you a story. I actually got to work with Edward G. Robinson one time. Mm. It was in the 70s, and he had retired. He had actually been uh, retired in Florida. He wrote a letter to, I think, Gillette or some razor company when they were first coming out with double-edged razors. That's how old it was. Okay. And he had, if you remember, in his olden days, it, it, later in his career, he had grown a, a handlebar or a mustache similar to mine. And what happened is the razor company called him back up and said, we love your letter. Thank you. Will you will you do a commercial for us? He said, sure, if the price is right. You know, he's an actor. He came to New York and we we were all set up. It was just like a Hollywood set. Everybody anticipating Edward G. Robinson. He walks in. He says, call me Eddie. <laughs> nicest guy in the whole world. Just the opposite of everything you had ever thought about Edward G. Robinson. And of course, I knew a little bit about him. One of my favorite Ed, Edward G. Robinson movies is, is Brother Orchid. Hmm. And in that one, he plays a very, well, not milk toast. He plays a gangster who's gone into a seminary and whatever. But it's a really sweet role for him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he did do, he did do some some very nice uh, non-gangster roles, non-tough guy roles. Uh, but they were were they not all later in his career? Um, yes and no. Um, I want to say that um, Edward G. Robinson cut his teeth in being a gangster, but almost at the start, he wanted to dispel that in every way he could. And the only way that Warner Brothers was going to allow him from uh, stepping away from the stereotype of Little Caesar, which was his, of course, breakthrough role, sure. was to kind of do comedic gangsters. And so he did a series of those where he gets to play a tough guy, but a tough guy in a very Damon Runyon-esque style, very friendly, uh, warm. You wouldn't ever confuse this guy with wanting to like gun down anybody. And it began <laughs> really early in the 30s with a movie called Little Giant, where he wants to walk away from the business of gangsterism. Yeah. Yeah. And he wants to be, develop more culture. And he meets, uh, he meets a young lady who kind of helps him and walks him through that. Uh, but there was a really great comedy that he did later on, I think late in the 30s, early 40s, called Larceny, Inc., where he plays not only a very funny gangster, but he's surrounded by equally funny gangsters. Yeah. And, and, of course, they're trying to rob a bank, and what they do is they buy a business, but he actually falls in love with the business as they are tunneling under the business to the bank <laughs> next door to try and steal some money. It, it is very, very funny. And of course, they, with, with the able help of, of people like like Jack Carson, you know, it's going to be a very lighthearted thing. Yeah. And so he tried to walk away from it through Warner Brothers studio system. And, and that was the only way he could do it. Later, when his contract allowed him to now travel to other studios, that is when Edward G. Robinson excelled as uh, breaking away from the stereotype of being a gangster. And he made a remarkable run of films. Even in the film noir setting, he would play characters that were far from being gangsters. Uh, I can think of two that were directed by Fritz Lang called Scarlet Street and Women in the Window, where he plays college professor or a very milquetoast um, yes. accountant. And yes. of course, he meets the femme fatale and everything goes wrong. I mean, the world just lands on this poor guy yeah. and there is just no saving him because he's, not, that, a, he's yeah. not a tough guy. No. And that and that these films were, were, were classic film. Noir. A double indemnity is another. He plays an insurance investigator who is trying to mentor Fred McMurray, not knowing that Fred McMurray is the actual person who committed the crime. And he may be tough. But he is a decent friend to Fred McMurray, and you see it throughout the um, throughout the film. And he, I think personally, he should have been nominated and win the, the Academy Award for that performance. It, it was that good. Mm. So, yeah, there's a series of films where he played those types. You know, uh, um, uh, just as uh, 
you say Edward G. Robinson, you think of gangsters. Uh, in his personal life, you would also think that maybe he was a rough and tumble guy, maybe a street guy, you know. But he was a very sophisticated art collector, yes. was he not? Yeah, he was, an, he was an entrepreneur through and through, and his art collection was prized. It was absolutely magnificent. He actually used some of his art pieces to help out folks in the 1950s who were blacklisted. I mean, he, he really had a, an art collection to die for, and he was very, very cultured. I think that the role that captures the true essence of Edward G. Robinson on film and Edward G. Robinson in person was a later role where he plays a very cultured gambler in The Cincinnati Kid. I think that oh. that's where you really get the real Edward G. Robinson. Yeah. And, and I think that that really, okay, what 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 role personifies his, his personal life and his professional life if you meld them together? It's The Cincinnati Kid. Very interesting, yeah. And you know, the other thing that he would do as well is as he got older, he started playing um, European types, like, you know, folks that were coming back from the fatherland. That fatherland might have been uh, Italy. So he played a lot of kind of Italian types. Um, and and he was good at them, and he was good at playing the immigrant, and in many cases, the very soft-hearted or maybe the stern father type of immigrant. And House of Strangers comes to mind with Richard Conte, and he plays the father, who's very, he rules with a tough hand. In fact, that was remade as a Western, Broken Lands with Spencer Tracy. But anyway, he would, he, he, you know, at the end of the day, if you, if you really wanted to characterize uh, Edward G. Robinson, there was a film with a perfect title that, um, that really captured who he was, essentially. And it was a movie he made with Margaret O'Brien called our vines have tender grapes. And that really was Edward G. Robinson. He was that vine, that tough vine with very tender grapes. Yeah. Well, I think we've probably given uh, most of our viewers a whole new look at Edward G. Robinson. Yeah, but what, let, me, let, me, let me end with one thing that I think is kind of cool. He wouldn't play the tough guys after a while. He kind of walked away from it because he, you know, he like like James Stewart, I'm, I'm sorry, James Cagney, like Humphrey Bogart, they wanted to do more than just that. I mean, James sure. Cagney wanted to be a dancer. Humphrey Bogart wanted to be, to, to be a yachtsman. He liked to do a lot of um, movies that involved boating. Edward G. Robinson uh, would do that, but he wasn't afraid to go back to the gangster role, and he did that later in his career with a very fine performance of Rocco, Johnny Rocco. Oh, absolutely. Argo. And absolutely. that was a later performance, and of course, he pl and the hero in that piece is, is Humphrey Bogart. Now, when I say all of this, a question that maybe you and Art might ask, well, we know that Edward G. Robinson played opposite Bogart a number of times. Ba yeah. Bullets bullets for Ballads, Brother Orchid, Key Largo. He did a lot of those those uh, those films. Did he ever work with James Cagney? They were the kings on the lot. And they did only one time. No it was kidding. really early 1932. It was a movie called Smart Money, where he plays one of these gangsters that wants to kind of go straight and get kind. And he's got a pal who's kind of the tough guy who watches over him, that pal in a supporting role is James Cagney. <laughs> <laughs> the star of the piece is actually Edward G. Robinson. And That's he and, and James Cagney lends support. They never work together again throughout their really iconic careers. Now that's odd, isn't it? I mean, they, do you know why? Did, was there any rumors about the, why it the studio been, kept apart? Bill, billing issues. I mean, sometimes billing would cost a situation. There was sure. a time when Spencer Tracy, for example, became so popular he couldn't make films with Clark Gable anymore because Clark Gable always was going to get top billing. And he and, and after a while, Spencer Tracy wanted that top billing. Yeah. I think yeah. the same thing happened to James Cagney. I think once he really, really succeeded with those series of Warner Brothers films that began with The Public Enemy, he did not want that billing to be any less than top. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Edward G. Robinson was already the top man. So they just weren't going to make films together at Warner Brothers. They were going to make their own series of films, develop a separate career. Errol yeah. Flynn did the same thing, very separate career at Warner Brothers. And yeah. Humphrey, poor Humphrey Bogart, 
he was kind of stuck being the third man in all of this until he finally established himself in the 40s. Edward G. Robinson came out with Little Caesar before the public enemy. So that made mm. him the top oh, okay. dog on the lot. Sure, sure. Well, that's Hollywood, isn't it? That is Hollywood. Classic Hollywood. Now, because of Manny Pacheco, not forgotten. Well, let's never forget Edward G. Robinson. He was one of my all-time favorite character actors who actually appeared above the titles of his yes. films. Yes. Good for him. Yeah, mine too. Thank, thank you. Uh, thanks to John. Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> for more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.